Okay, so this week I'm going to share a few teaching ideas for all of you teachers out there, including you moms, for Isaiah 40 through 49. So there's 10 chapters. I'll just share a few things. I'll share one general idea that you can use anytime, which is a great one. Last night I went to a primary activity days just to see what was going on. And they had all of the, uh, the primary kids create a little storyboard. In other words, a piece of paper, and then they cut out little characters, little people, and a building. And they would put the characters where they want them, and then they took a picture. And then they'd move the characters a little bit, take another picture. One lady had an app on her phone that did it. Another one just used the camera time lapse, where it just snaps a picture every so often, and they'd move the pieces. And then when you hit playback, they'd watch it, and all the pieces would move like the old-time cartoons, right? So you could have, maybe maybe there's a story in one of these chapters that, or scriptures later on, that uh, you want the kids to really understand. Well, fun way to do that is, okay, you guys read the story and then draw it out and then we're going to show them what you're going to do and tell them how to do that. Uh, fun activity, but they have to internalize the story in order to act it out. That's true with role play uh, or... A theatrical approach, right? Which is kind of fun for some kids. Like, I want you to act out what's going on in this scene here. Uh, just another fun way to understand it. They, they read to understand. Just like watching a video. If there's a video of the story, you see things different than if you're just reading the text. And you see an interpretation of it. And then you can say, okay, is this what's really happening in the text when you watch this? So a little bit of fun with that. We've talked about music and a whole bunch of other fun learning activities that you can do with your family and classes this past few weeks. Um, there's another idea. So let's go to Isaiah chapter 40 and start with verse 1. We've talked about music in the past, but verse 1 is a song. It's the text to one of Handel's Messiah. Again, uh, not the most kid-friendly, uh, meaning exciting song in the Handel's Messiah, but it is one that you could uh, listen to if you wanted to. I like to play stuff like that just to because it's almost like an opera style. When the kids walk in, they're like, what is this? And then you just kind of laugh with them and say, this is today's lesson, and, and uh, watch their reaction. It's kind of funny. Okay, let's take a look at a couple of things here. Chapter 40, uh, verse 2. I want to address this one for just a moment here. There's a line in there that says, her iniquity is pardoned, speaking about J Jerusalem. Uh, you could go into the deep doctrine of, of pardon, pardonable, unpardonable, uh, forgivable, unforgivable, it, but I, I think there's a power in here where, this, where Isaiah's words kind of change. I mean, he talks about the destructions, and now all of a sudden he's talking about Jerusalem and her people will be pardoned. They'll be forgiven. They'll be restored. They'll be redeemed. So there's a lot of hope in several of these chapters that you're going to be reading this week. I think it's important to point out that hope. So one more thought. In the seminary side of things, you'll see how many doctrinal masteries are in Isaiah. There are a lot of them. Why? Because Isaiah teaches doctrine. If you want your kids or youth or young adults to understand the doctrine of the gospel of the Jesus of Jesus Christ, read Isaiah. He covers the doctrine. Isaiah 1, repentance, the, the doctrine of the restoration, Isaiah 29. I mean, there's so many of these. The doctrine of, of the atonement of Jesus Christ, uh, which will be upcoming, right, in 53. Uh, 55 has uh, doctrine about the Savior and about how God works. I mean, there's so many doctrines in here. You just have to find them. And, and, and in a more poetic fashion, it makes them more enjoyable. In other words, you know, the, the Lord could just say, repent. Okay, there's the doctrine of repentance. But Isaiah makes it much more fun. Uh, Isaiah 118 again. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as wool, snow. Uh, all those colorful wordings in there. Again, you just have to unpack it, open it up little by little and say, what is he saying here? And it makes it much more colorful. It takes more work, but it's definitely much more enjoyable once you get through that unpacking. So again, verse two, her, par her iniquity is pardoned. 
Uh, most of what I'm going to give you this week for tools is just questions. A, a question might be is how can we let the Lord pardon us? How can Jesus Christ forgive us? What do we have to do to let him do that? Uh, what's our role? What's his role? That might be a question and a discussion. Again, you can open up the core document and uh, study that section. Uh, for parents, if you don't know what the core document is, go to your Gospel Library app, type in core document under search, or you go into the seminary and institute site under seminary, there's a core document that discusses nine basic doctrines. And it clearly explains each of those doctrines that we believe in. And many of them are covered in the Isaiah readings. So let's do one more verse in, in uh, chapter 40. Go to verse 31. Verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Now, the rest of it, they shall mount up with wings as eagles. If you've ever seen the movie... Remember the Titans? There's that whole scene in the movie where that verse is what's quoted. And they chant it and they get going. It's kind of a fun uh, a fun scene in a movie um, that you could watch as a family. That's a fun Friday night one. And then when you get to that scene, stop it, the movie, read the verse, and help your kids make that connection. Okay, here's the world and their movie of football and the energy. And then they're using the scripture to motivate them. What does the scripture mean to us? And you can have a little bit of fun with that. Also, well, there's a lot of details with that one. Like you can go into the Hebrew wording in there. But basic, basically, notice the reward. If, if you wait upon the Lord, you get strength. That phrase, wait upon the Lord, or some form of it in Hebrew, is found almost 30 times just in the King James Version, when they translated that from the Hebrew. Over and over and over, here's the message. Wait upon the Lord, you'll receive strength. So maybe you have the discussion, what does it mean to wait? What does that look like in today's world? Waiting upon the Lord. What do we have to wait for? I'd ask that question and have the kids answer it. See, are there ever times you want to do something, but the Lord says, wait? Maybe start out with a question about what are some things you have to wait for? Planting a crop. You know, I want fresh corn. You plant it in the spring. You have to wait. There's no way around it. Baking. You can make a cake batter. Say, guys, go ahead and eat it. No, we have to cook it first. You have to wait. How long do you have to wait? What if you eat it early? What if you wait too long and you don't get it at the right time? Uh, waiting is an important principle of the gospel. Uh, some people, I want to get baptized before I'm eight. I want to start dating, or I want to have a family, or I want to go to the temple. Some of those things people don't wait for, and there's consequences. Some of the things you have to wait for. There, there's not even an option, right? You can't get baptized the day before you turn eight. The church won't allow it. Uh, you can't go on a mission before you reach a certain age. You have to wait. Some things we decide, I'm not going to wait. It's no big deal. And we jump the gun. But there's a value in learning to wait. That's a principle I would teach. Um, if I were uh, teaching a seminary class or a mom, I would teach that principle and have a little bit of fun doing that. Maybe bake a cake as a family. Let's go to chapter 42 now for a moment. Chapter 42. Will you go to verse 1? The word elect is in there. Again, when they translate the word elect, they also translate it to mean saints. So reread it and put the word saints. And for us, we could say Latter-day Saints. It's the same group of people. Um, Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, my, my saints who I'm chosen. Uh, I, I love that. There's some fun things in there. Also in that same chapter, let's go down to verse 24 and 25. You'll notice in there that there's a consequence to some of their actions. And at the end of 24, it says, Neither were they obedient unto this law. Therefore, he hath poured out upon him the fury of his anger. 
so, you could possibly talk, you know, sometimes there's very strong actions to breaking the law. Again, there's the doctrine of obedience, the law of obedience, and it's obedience to laws, not whims, not demands, but obedience to laws. Maybe have a discussion about what are the laws of the gospel? What is the law of obedience? It, the law of obedience is the first law in heaven. Now, you know what the first ordinance is? It's baptism, right? You know what the first principle is? Faith. But obedience is the first law of heaven. Maybe ask why. Why does obedience have to come before some of the other laws? Think about the chronology of the five laws there. Yeah, I love that. Let's go to chapter 44 now. Chapter 44, verses 3 and 4. Have you ever been thirsty? I mean, you're just parched. What if someone brought a, um, what are those little droppers that just give you a drop of water? Like, I am so thirsty, you're ready to die. And someone brings you a dropper. Let me give you a drop of water. I think there's an analogy in there. Versus bring a big old five-gallon water uh, container full of ice water. Say, if you're thirsty, which one would you want to have access to? And then read verse 3. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty. How much water? Is it a drop? Notice the next words. And floods upon the dry ground. Again, picture yourself in a desert. And a drop of water versus a flood of water. When the Savior blesses us, he, he, again, Isaiah is showing this colorful language here. It will be floods upon the dry ground. And then the next part, I will pour my spirit upon my seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. So again, how does he want to bless us? Not with drops, buckets, floods of blessings. So I ask, how has the Lord blessed you? What have you done to allow the Lord to Pour blessings upon you. Maybe you link that with the principles of obedience. And then remember the great scripture. All blessings are predicated upon principles of obedience. Verse 4. They shall spring up as among the grass and willows by the water. Again, whenever you go to any creek, any water, there's... Grass always, you can be in the middle of the desert and you have a little bit of creek, come through. there's grass right around the edges of that water. That's what blessings will be like if we are obedient to the principles of the gospel. So make that connection in there. It's a lot of fun. Same chapter, let's go down to verse 9. They that make a graven image are all of them vanity, and their delectable thing shall not profit. And they are their own witnesses. They see not, nor know that they may be ashamed. So this ashamed is going to play a key word here in a minute here. In other words, maybe have your, your, your kids or your class make a list of all of the things, tangible things that they own that are valuable to them. Make a list. And then say, notice in here, all of the things, the graven images. In other words, the things that you can possess. It might be your phone, it could be a car, it could be a toy, it could be your wardrobe, your shoes. I mean, whatever you use that could possibly be a, a graven image or something for vanity, a delectable thing. Uh, notice what it was. will do there. Notice the footnote there uh, on delectable is beloved things, things that you just love to have. It shall not profit. In other words, eternally, none of those physical things will profit you. You can't take them with you, right? In fact, maybe make a list. Okay, now you've made a list of things you like. Now, if God came right now and took all of those things from you, uh, what would you have left? Or maybe is which of those things would be more valuable or more important to you than... Uh, being with God in heaven and feeling peace and love uh, or whatever you want, you, an eternal family. You, 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 we have to make it a fair comparison because some kids might say, well, this stuff's more important than, it, than my family is. We have to show that here's what 
you have, here's what the Lord wants you to have. Um, make that comparison because one thing won't be valuable to you anymore, right? Love it. Um, let's go to chapter 45. Chapter 45, verse 2. Oh, no, let's read the head note. Uh, chapter 45, it says, Cyrus will free the captives of Israel from Babylon. Okay, there are many scholars out there and people who think there's more than one writer in Isaiah. Partly, partly, I believe, it's because they don't have faith in a prophet or a seer. Because remember, we, here's you have to understand a little bit of time. Isaiah was writing at the time the Assyrian destruction took place up north. So we're talking uh, between seven and 800 BC. Uh, Cyrus and Babylon didn't free cap. They didn't take Judah captive until the 500s, 589, five, you know, right in that time period. So we're talking more than a hundred years before it's happened. Isaiah's prophesying. Them. Now you and I have a testimony of prophets and seers. They can see the future. So I believe it's the same Isaiah. Now, you could have more than one writer. I don't have a problem with somebody else adding some words and, and have it be inspired. But I really believe Isaiah saw the future, and he sees the redemption of Judah. And remember, he's warning Judah, repent, or what's going to happen to us? What happened to uh, Israel is going to happen to Ju uh, Jerusalem and Judah, which it did more than 100 years later. So there's some cool things in there. But let's go to verse 19. Chapter 45, verse 19. Again, here is a, here's another doctrine. I, quote, I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. God doesn't do things in secret. I know a lot of people think, well, it's in the temples a secret. No, it's not. We allow anybody to, to join the church and go to the temple. Anybody can. There is not a, no, I'm sorry, you can't join the church and you can't go. It's really... Anybody who qualifies and repents can go to the temple. There's nothing. We do everything in open. Whereas the devil works in darkness. He works in secret. Uh, so the gospel is restored and we declare things openly. The missionaries will openly declare everything. General Conference is pretty open about everything that we believe. We don't do things in secret. Now, there's some things that are private, uh, but they're not in secret. There's a big difference there. You can learn everything about the restored gospel of Jesus Christ and open. Let's go to verse 23. Just down a couple more. Again, that phrase every kid needs to learn. Uh, the end of verse 23. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. Now, in the word swear there means to make an oath. Eventually, everybody will, will, will kneel. Uh, my favorite Elder Maxwell quote may have been, and I'm paraphrasing here, when he said, it won't be do you much good to drop on your knees when you're no longer able to stand. I mean, there will be a point when every knee will be bowing and every tongue will be making an oath to follow the Savior, Jesus Christ. I love that. And with that, the cross-reference to Romans 14.11. That's Romans 14.11, which changes it, the word to confess. So, our youth should be familiar with that phrase. I love it. So let's go, let's go all the way to chapter 48 now. So here's some, hopefully this is some helpful ideas for you to, to think about, to ponder, to, to teach when you're working with it. Chapter 48, go to verse 4. I like this word because I think it talks about me, because I know that thou art obstinate. Uh, and thy neck is an iron sinew, and thy brow brass. Okay. When are we obstinate? I, I think that's a question you ask your class. Do you know someone who's stubborn? I think God knows that we as people overall are stubborn by nature. Uh, why is a neck iron? If your neck is made out of iron, it can't bend. And the Lord wants us to bow our heads. That's a form of, of humility. I'm bowing my head. But if my neck is iron, can't bend it. I don't know if you could get a piece of iron and take it to class or have your kids hold it. So they bend it and, that, and they, if it's too big, they can't. And just say, you know, is this, is this you? Is the Lord, does the Lord want to bend you into something that he needs you to be in? But you're so obstinate that he, you're not allowing to be. That, that's a great visual in there. 
And let's go to verse 22. Same chapter, chapter 48, verse 22. There is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. Maybe ask, how do you know that's true? Because it sure looks like the people in the great and spacious building are having a lot of fun. And maybe ask, you know, what does that look like? There might be fun and excitement, but there's no peace. How do you get peace? I, I really think the only way is through the Prince of Peace. And then maybe ask those questions. How have you felt peace during difficult or troubled times? And create an element of peace. There's hymns. Uh, where can I turn for peace? And you say, guys, have you ever been picked on? Have you ever had a bad day? Have you ever been bullied? Where can you go for peace? Uh, through the Prince of Peace. And I would emphasize that with your family and your uh, class. Let's end with chapter uh, 49. Isaiah 49, go to verse 22. No, I'm going to do 15 because I really like 15. Verse 15, can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Again, I'm not a mother. I've never nursed a baby, but I understand physically uh, women know it's time to nurse. They physically can feel that. Uh, And how can you forget a baby? It's almost ludicrous. It's ridiculous. I think Isaiah is saying it's impossible for a woman to forget to feed her child. But notice what he says here. Yea, they may forget. In other words, as ridiculous as that is, that's at least possible. But the thing that's not impossible is the end of verse 15. Yea, I will not forget thee. And then he says, why? How can the Lord never forget us? Verse 16, behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. Now, the palms of the hands, we always see the, the imagery, right? The Savior has marks. Uh, even through the atonement of Jesus Christ and his complete resurrection and ascension into heaven, the marks of his hands were not removed. All scars will be erased, but those marks are eternal. They're, it's an, it's, this is my word, an eternal uh, token of the atonement. He can't forget us because we're always before him on the palms of his hands. But notice the next part. Thy walls are continually before me. What walls? Well, in back in Isaiah's days, every city that had a wall around it for protection. So the Savior is putting his walls around us. The Savior through his hands uh, to remind him that he won't forget us, that he's putting a wall around us to protect us from the adversary and the enemy. The only way the enemy destroys us is if we walk outside of his wall. We step outside of his protection. So again, if you have little kids, maybe build a little fort. Have you ever done that? If you're inside the fort with made out of tents or, or uh, blankets and sheets, you're safe. They can't get you, right? Uh, a class, maybe you just talk about the fort. Build a fort. If you're inside the wall, you're not going to get killed. And the Savior won't forget about you because he's built his wall and his hands are continually before. I, I love the imagery in there. Have some fun with that. And then let's go to verse 22 now. Uh, 22. In the middle of there, it says, well, I'll read the whole thing. There, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles and set up my standard to the people. Now, if I were teaching a seminary class in a church building and there was a basketball standard, I'd say, I just, okay, guys. Follow me. Stand up. Walk out there. Okay, go to the standard. How tall is it? It's 10 foot tall. How big's the the rim? It's 29 and a half inches twice because two basketballs fit exactly inside of that cylinder. What would you, what would be like if you played a game and one week the hoop was 12 feet and the next week it was not, it'd be a different game. It's a standard because it's the same everywhere you go and for everybody. What are the standards of the church? They don't change. There's a standard. When the Lord sets a standard, it's the same anywhere and everywhere. The word of wisdom is the same wherever you go. The law of chastity is the same. Every temple I've ever been in, it's the same covenants I make. Baptism is by immersion everywhere, not just where there's water and it's convenient, right? The standards are. So go find a standard, maybe a soccer goal. Um, a football goalpost. I mean, there's a standard out there. And then say, okay, what are the Lord's standards? 
this would be a great opportunity to pull out the For Strength of Youth pamphlet. Uh, in the Gospel Library app now, they call it My Standards or Youth Standards. And just maybe, okay, I want everyone to pick a standard. I'm going to give you a few minutes to study it. And then I want you to do a one-minute or a two-minute presentation on what the standard is. You can do it by drawing a picture. You can do it by just telling us. You can do some kind of a presentation, however you want. I want you to, to explain the Lord's standard and review through those standards. Uh, family, kids, let's open up the For Strength of Youth pamphlet. Let's pick a standard of the day for the next week or something like that. And just you kids, on your own, you, I'm just going to give you a couple minutes to read it. And you just come tell mom and dad, what's the standard? And then what does that look like for our family? What does that mean for us? And do a standard of the day. And then verse 23, we'll end up with. And kings shall be thy nursing fathers and their queens thy nursing mothers. They shall bow down. And again, that whole imagery there is, if a king and a queen is nursing you and taking care of you, who are you? You're a prince or a princess. You are protected. You are royalty. That's who you are. And they shall bow down with thee and their face toward the earth and lick up the dust of thy feet. And thou shalt know that I am the Lord. For they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. Again, there's that wait upon the Lord. If you wait upon the Lord, what's the result? Well, you're not going to be ashamed. In other words, it's not going to be disappointing. Like, oh man, everyone who waited for the Savior to come back or kept the commandments, man, it's too bad. that They, they waited for nothing. No, in the end, when you wait upon the Lord, you will not be ashamed. And uh, great scriptures in there. Maybe ask, what, is, what are some things that are worth waiting for? Uh, what are some things you should stand up for and never be ashamed of? You can have some fun with that. Well, I hope you got some helpful ideas here. Enjoy studying and teaching Isaiah. There's some great things this week, as there have been every week. And then next week, we'll do some even more cool things. Good luck to you.